you like this episode, please subscribe, share with others, rate and review so we can continue to bring you great programming. This is The Thing About Cars, a podcast for car enthusiasts and the people who love them. That's too funny. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, I didn't even mean. Can I do it again? No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just live with it. Hello and welcome. This is the thing about cars. I'm one of your hosts, Mickey Desai. The rest of us are <laughs> around the table. We first we have Don. Don, how are you doing today? Meow. <laughs> <laughs> See, no one else is going to know why we're laughing at that, and that's all. I know. <laughs> My cat Ferrari is uh, is is playing with his toys, and he has a mouse in his mouth, and he's just meowing. So that's hilarious. He's so saying he did, hello, everybody. I'm right. Ferrari. <laughs> Dave, how are you doing today, Dave? Uh, actually disturbed because while Don makes it sound like the, the cat is playing, it actually sounds like it's hacking up a hairball right next to a microphone. <laughs> oh, that poor kitty. And Ben, Ben, how are your cats today? Oh, they're pretty fantastic. And our <laughs> older one does kind of the same thing, but she only does it at night after we go to bed. Of course. <laughs> that's that's what a cat's function is, is just to, you know, throw you in the, the daily curveball. Well, she does it at the other end of the house, so it's not terribly loud, but I hear the howling coming from down the living room, and I say, oh, Fiona of the jungle is out hunting again. <laughs> what, yep. were you about to, what were you about to say, Dave? You know what? At this point, the show's already off the rails. <laughs> Let's just follow it. <laughs> ben has our grand trivia auto question for the day. Ben, can you can you get us started? Yes, I can. The question is, what was the first foreign automaker to assemble cars in the United States? The first foreign automaker to assemble cars in the U.S. Yeah. Was it Toyota, Volkswagen, Rolls-Royce, or Honda? Hmm. That's a good question. All right. Yeah. We will answer that at the end of the show. Uh, our first segment for today is, is basically a listener question. Ben also has a listener question for us. Uh, what have you got, Ben? Well, my old friend Scooter Parker contacted me, and uh, his question was, can I run 100 LL aviation fuel in a Chevrolet Silverado? <laughs> I don't know. The question is, can you, as opposed to should you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Well, that, that leads right into it because uh, he, there, there are various different short and long answers to this, but we may as well cover the, the whole ground with it uh, without, you know, getting too deep into the weeds. But uh, the, the short answer is you can, but you shouldn't. <laughs> yes. First off, let's get the, the legal bits out of the way here. Uh, doing so is illegal. It, it is against the law to dispense aviation fuel for use on the road because it is not subject to the fuel taxes that you know all road fuels are required to have paid on them. It's perfectly legal to run it in your lawnmower. However, the guy at the FBO, uh, you know, the, the pl place where you go to get it, you know, airplane plays at the airport where they, you know, fuel them and fix them and all that. The guys there may not want to dispense it into anything other than an actual aircraft fuel tank. Some will dispense it into, you know, five gallon jugs and things if they like you or, you know, you give them a good enough story, you know, tell them you got a Piper Cub at your farm out in the country or something. <laughs> uh, although that doesn't really, you know, cut it either, because honestly, there aren't really any places in the United States where you can keep a private aircraft that are not within reasonable distance of an airport that has fuel. Right. Uh, unless maybe you're in Alaska or something. But right. uh, yeah, so with, with that out of the way, well, what is 100 LL aviation fuel? Right, here comes the science, right? We're going to, this, this is the science portion. Yeah, if you can edit in some kind of funny little warning science alert sound effect. You know. <laughs> uh, it's Ben, it, the science guy. <laughs> right. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's basically leaded gasoline. Uh, it's roughly equivalent to the leaded premium that you got back in the 60s. Hmm. You know, it's, it's got the, the LL stands for low lead, but there's nothing low about it. It's chock full of tetraethyl lead. And that's in there as, you know, an anti-knock agent. The same reason it was in car gas for right. me. Although the, the uh, you know, the combustion process in an aircraft engine is a little bit more demanding. These are engines that tend to operate at very low RPM compared to car engines. A lot of them redline in, you know, the neighborhood of, you know, sub 4,000 RPM. But they're large displacement, air-cooled you know, engines, uh, the ones that I flew back when I was playing with airplanes, they were, you know, 318 cubic inches, which is the same size as some Chrysler V8s. It's the same size as the one in my dad's old Plymouth, 
but that that 318 cubic inches or a little more than five liters was only carved up into four cylinders it was right. horizontally opposed a flat four with push rod valves basically a, a big huge volkswagen engine so you know the operating temperatures are a little bit different and you do have issues where when you get at high altitude you get into lean mixtures it's like that you know knock control is very important that's why a lot of uh, aviation, well, that's why aviation gasoline generally is still leaded, although this could probably be overcome with modern technology, but there are just so many old airplanes out there yeah. that there's no point changing the fuel right now. So coming back to uh, a road vehicle, what does this mean if you put this stuff in your car or your Chevy Silverado or whatever? Well, that depends on the vehicle. If it's an old vehicle like my Lotus, it'll run just fine, no problems. But you put it in a modern vehicle and you run into the lead problem. Lead will do two things. It will destroy the catalytic converter and it will go. destroy the oxygen. Destroying the catalytic converter, not such a big deal. You'll get a check engine light if your catalytic converter isn't working. However, once you destroy the oxygen sensors, then your engine management system is really not going to run right. The thing's going to run like crap, at least until it gets to the point where, you know, it just has zero feedback and then it probably won't run at all. Right. Or in limp mode or something. So, and then on top of it all, aviation gasoline is expensive. It's, I think, I haven't checked actually recently. I should have before the show, but it, last time I you know, did know what it cost, it was roughly twice what car gas went. For. So why would you want to pay for it? The other aspect is the 100 part of its name. That's 100 octane. And there is no reason to run that in a road vehicle because... Uh, and here's where we really have to be careful not to go too deep into the weeds. You know, what is octane? Well, octane is gasoline. <laughs> what it refers to is the molecular composition. Right. Uh, octane, okay, gasoline essentially is a polymer molecule. So it's a chain type molecule that's got repeating elements. Octane refers to eight of those elements ganged up in the molecule. And eight is basically the perfect density for use in, you know, ground-based motor vehicles. It's basically uh, a measure of how many hydrogen bonds you can break. Yeah. Uh, and 100 is as high as you can you know, effectively use uh, anywhere near sea level and in you know, standard compression engines. And, you remember that stuff called 103 octane, 103 plus octane boost? Yeah. What does that do? It wastes your money. <laughs> <laughs> And now it does have some other additives that maybe help clean fuel injectors and things like that. It was nothing yeah, but naphthalene. That's what it was. That's, that's right. All, yeah. it, it did not actually increase your octane because if it doesn't contain any, you know, gasoline molecules, it actually reduces your octane by dissolving the whole mix. Basically, if you're buying like 91 or 87 grade, that basically that means that's the percentage of, you know, eight molecule or eight atom or, or rather eight bond, you know, molecules in your gasoline. Uh, the remainder are going to be ones that have, you know, probably seven, maybe a little bit of nine. Uh, but the thing is, unless you're running a really, really high compression engine, standard pump gas is all you need. And, uh, you know, honestly, if you're curious, you know, what your car should be running on, Try really, really low grade. If you get a bunch of knocking, then go to the next higher grade. You know, go up grades until the knocking stops, and then you're at your golden spot. And running any higher octane than what your engine needs is a complete waste of your time and money. There is. I, hmm? I'm going to agree with you, Ben, because I think also, you know, the, having been in aviation for so many years, this question always comes up, and it really comes to the people's motivation of yeah. why they would want to do it. And there's a mistaken belief out there that avgas is more powerful. You're going to be able to go faster, do something that you can. Right. And it's and and that's not the case. It's the the fundamentals of the engines are so different that you know even though it, you know it, gas is designed to optimize a specific type of engine, and it will not optimize another engine that's not designed for it. Right, yeah. I know a lot of hot rodders used to use it, uh, you know, probably out of the same mistaken beliefs. I heard of guys who'd go get a five-gallon jug of it before a race, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> if it makes them happy. <laughs> right. Plus, so, it's just not a good idea to be spewing lead all over creation. So any any idea why your friend Scooter wanted to uh, do this to his car? I don't know. Uh, Does he have a death wish for his engine? I don't know. Uh, you know uh, I, I really didn't follow up on the circumstances, but I, I told him don't do it, and I explained why, and I, I think he you know, got it. 
All right. Good question. Excellent question, Scooter. That's good stuff. By the way, are we calling him Scooter or are we calling him Josh? Is that is does that matter? I personally approve of the name, nickname Scooter. Scooter's a good nickname. You can call him Beverly for all I care. <laughs> <laughs> I've known him since he was 12 years old and he's used it since then. So thank you, Scooter, for the question. Uh, and thanks, Ben, for bringing it to the table with, with a really good dissection. I think that was really good. I often think about that. Like, like, do I want to put, do I want to put airline fuel in my gas tank? And the answer, of course, is no, I don't want to do it. Oh, as an interesting aside to uh, the uh, Octane Boost stuff you mentioned, you know, there's also that from the, that same NOS Plus brand, they've got uh, you know various different additives out. But if you, if you ever want to you know kill some time reading a really hilarious story of motor idiocy, somewhere out there in the interwebs, you can find a forum thread. It's on a, a sport bike forum where this guy's you know crotch rocket bike was running real crappy, so he goes to the convenience store buys what he thinks is a bottle of the NOS plus fuel additive, dumps it in his tank, it runs even worse. And what comes out through this long, long thread is that he did not actually buy the fuel additive. He bought the sports drink that is sold under the same brand. <laughs> and of course the sugar in it screwed up his fuel system, trashed his injectors, all that stuff. The thread goes on for, I don't know, 18 pages or something like that. But you know, I gotta hand it to the guy. He he totally owns it. He he goes, whoa, I really messed up. Yeah, he 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 doesn't make any excuses. He he lives with it. He he lives it down in the thread. So <laughs> but it's pretty hilarious reading. <laughs> all right. I'm definitely gonna have to check that out. Let's take a minute and check in on our movie list. We we at one time had everybody in the show compile their list of their top five automotive or, or, or journey related movies. Maybe now is a good time to, to revisit that and talk a little bit more about car movies for a few minutes. Dave, you want to get us started? Sure. So last time we, we had this discussion, Ben and I had both picked the same top movie, which was oh, yeah. it's a mad, 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 mad world. I thought it was and a gumball rally. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, we both picked Gumball Rally. Yes, you're right. Was a, we both picked Gumball Rally. Again, mine. So we're on, for. I'm on my number three because Ben took my number one. My number three was in 1995. Patrick Swayze, Swayze, Wesley Slipes, and John Leguizamo in Two Wu Fong. Thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. Uh. <laughs> the 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 car in question is a 1967 yellow Cadillac DeVille convertible that that they travel across country in. And, you know, the car is is you know roughly the size of a city block. First of all, you know, it, it's one of those movies that, you know, starts with a really hot shot of Patrick Swayze. So I'm bought into the movie at the very, very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. But but when when they pull into this car, this car kind of becomes the leitmotif of the entire movie of trying to fix it. And all of the, you know, all of the best drama scenes more or less take place around it. And I, I forget the, what we talked about, there's one car, I think Misty talked about it, that like Miatas show up in more movies than any place else. The car is just always there kind of watching. It play, almost plays the role of a Greek chorus in, in you know, classic theater. Um, plus <laughs> nice. <laughs> so wait, <laughs> can you have a one voice chorus? <laughs> depends, <laughs> depends how many personalities you have, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> Inside of my head, most days sounds like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Are the harmonies least, that good? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, at least you can harmonize and. And yeah, <laughs> you don't have the rolling chaos. That's my brain, for instance. That's, uh, yes, I'm jealous, but uh, excellent stuff. Too Wong Fu. I, you know, I never checked out that movie. I'm going to have to check it out now. It, it, I've seen it. It's been a long time. Yeah, long, it, long time. It's one of those movies watching once every 10 years is probably plenty. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm intrigued. Now I'm like, hmm, okay. Dawn, what about you? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. Every time this movie comes on, I have to watch it. I don't care where it's at in the movie. Uh, even if I can only catch like one segment, it's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Of course. Uh, and yes. of course, it's, uh, yeah. it's the Ferrari GT, uh, which was a replica. I did yeah. some history, you know, did some research about the movie car 
And it was it was a replica that there was actually three replicas that they used in the film. And it was based on a, a 61 Ferrari GT in a magazine. The replica model was called the GT Spider California. And it was built by Neil Glassmoyer and Mark Goet at the Modena Design and Development. The Ferrari now, you know, I told you my theme seemed to be that cars were were hurt in the making of the film. You know, we I think we need an ASPSC for uh, movies, for cars. <laughs> <laughs> no, there should be, no car was harmed in the making of this movie. <laughs> I like this idea, actually. But the Ferrari that, that did end up going out the back of the beautiful glass, you know, garage was, uh, didn't run. It, you know, it went to its death, but it, it was all, it was all movie magic that made it actually jump out the back of that uh, garage and when it did you know that scene where they go into chicago and they give it to somebody to park it and then you see it later you know the guy the valet parking it somewhere or he wasn't a valet but the the parking person yes and he jumps it and it lands and it was that even that replica was badly damaged uh and oh, had yeah. to be repaired later because I, I mean, you think of that scene, it's like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's almost as bad as when it goes out the back of the garage. Yeah, I knew it was a replica the first time I saw the film as a teenage kid. And uh, you want to know how I knew? <laughs> how, how did you know, Ben? How did you know? By the taillights. They came off an MGB. <laughs> okay, there that's... You go. That's super nerdy right there. That's fantastic. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. it is. <laughs> it also had, it was an automatic. They put in a, a Ford V8 because supposedly, now this is a rumor, Matthew Broderick couldn't drive a standard. Or, so it was a front engine, rear wheel drive. I, I don't know. It was. It's a really cool car. That's, when you know, the model that it's based off of has been selling for millions and millions of dollars from yes. that year. Yeah. But yeah. last year, right before the pandemic, that particular one of the particular replicas sold for 396,000 at Bear Jackson. That's crazy. In Scottsdale. Yes. So yeah, so. it's uh I I think I just that movie is so high school fun. What year did that come out? Uh, I I want to say oh, I didn't even look up what year. I think it was 80 Five. Oh, it was 86. Yeah. As we and say, I would I have thought, been yeah. freshman, sophomore in college. I was a junior in college. Or okay. ju no, actually, yeah, freshman, sophomore. Yeah, sophomore right. in college. So, yeah. yeah, it's just so iconic. Everything about that movie and that car in that movie. Well, that too much fun. And you, the whole time you're like, oh, please don't hurt that car. Oh, please don't hurt that car. <laughs> I was completely drawn into that film when I first saw it. I didn't even, you know, in my logical mind, I completely just forgot to remember that they're going to be using replicas and stuff. And like you say, I was on the edge of my seat thinking, okay, they're going to screw up this car and I'm going to cry. And then they screwed up the car and I almost cried. <laughs> <laughs> See? So, yeah. yeah. Every, and then, of course, the whole anxiety of ferris's buddy you know yep. th there was a whole mental ethos wrapped up in that just you oh. know, so the car kind of told a story on its own yeah although it, if it, i had one of those i would probably develop a shrine to it just like that father figure you know a room dedicated just to the car yeah i've yeah. been next to uh, a real one in traffic wow yeah, the real one of that, uh, the GT California Spider or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you guys remember the, the local Ferrari dealer where we recorded at Italian Car Day last year, yeah. uh, I used to work a couple blocks behind there. And coming home from work one day, I'm turning the corner at the top of the hill right by the place. And here this car comes off the lot. It was probably the guy who owned the place. Uh, he had some kind of boutique grocery bag in the passenger seat. And uh, we were next to each other for a couple blocks. It was just a really cool experience. I took pictures, of course, and sent them to a friend of mine who, you know, was totally blown away by this. And, uh, I, I probably can't even say the expletives that he, uh, you know, texted back with when I told him approximately what the thing was worth. But, you know, the other cars in the movie, they're just background elements. They don't really tell much story, but they are pretty cool, too. Uh, Cameron, for instance, that little white car he drove was an Alfa Romeo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alpha Sud, as I if I recall correctly, I believe there was an MGTC in his dad's garage as well. Uh, and of course, Ferris's parents, uh, you know, the, the the big American station wagon, the nice little Audi, uh, and I want to think his sister was driving a Fiero. 
That's I correct. think, yes, she was driving a Fiero. Yeah, there are some fun cars in the movie. And the lines to the cars, it's like, Ferris got this and I got this car, you know, and it's a cute little fear that yeah. she, she drives around a lot of, you know, all, so many iconic people from that era in that movie, uh, you know, besides Matthew Broderick, Alan Ruck and Cindy Plickett, Jennifer Grey, I mean, who played you know, Ferris's sister and then the cameo by uh, Sheen. Yeah. Char- Charlie Sheen. I wonder what his character drove. A motorcycle. Probably. <laughs> Probably, yeah. But it's a good movie. Ben's Probably what, a, uh, you know. What's your movie, Ben? Yeah, well, it's a little bit of a, yeah, well, yes and no. I was about to say it was a little bit of a cop-out because it's not really one movie. It's a bunch of movies, but you can't separate one of them out because there are so many that are just totally cartastic. And what I'm thinking of, of course, uh, are the James Bond movies. <laughs> Of course, if you had to pick one for total, you know, car iconicness, even that would be difficult because you've got Goldfinger and The Spy Who Loved Me. Right. Uh, but there's so much great stuff in some of the other ones. Even if you go back to the books, in the books, 007 drove what was referred to as a blower Bentley. It was a 1920s supercharged sport model that it had its you know frame cut shorter to fit a smaller, tighter body onto it. Uh, you know, by the time the movies came around, so many cool things. Several, you know, Mustangs show up in, uh, I believe there's one in Goldfinger and another one in Thunderball. Uh, there's also the Fastback Mustang in Diamonds Are Forever. Too bad Becca's not here. Uh, the Fastback Mustang in Diamonds Are Forever, of course, is notable for being on you know, the two wheels on one side going into a narrow alley and coming out of the narrow alley on the other two wheels. Right. Uh, it's one of those great super spy tricks. Um, you know, then you've got uh, you know, the, the AMC, I think it was an AMX in, um, oh, which was it? Um, yeah, I'm, dr- I'm, I'm blanking here and I can't believe this because I'm such a diehard fan. Oh, well, you had the AMC Hornet in The Man with the Golden Gun. That too, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think there was a matador that some guys got away in. That That's correct. That's right. They stuck some wings on top of and flew in. And I, I would not want to fly in an AMC myself. <laughs> um, Even if it had av gas in it? Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and of course, in The Spy Who, not The Spy Who Loved Me, um, yeah, For Your Eyes Only, which is the other one with a cool esprit in it, uh, For Your Eyes Only has some great, you know, chases in it. There's a there's a great chase scene where, you know, Bond and the and the girl uh, found they found themselves strapped into a Citroen 2CV, a little yellow one, uh, which they put the four cylinder engine from a four CV, which is a larger car, into to make the the scene so the thing would have enough get up and go. But it's a fabulous chase scene because here's this just crap bucket little car. <laughs> It's it's barely a car. It's it's like a little itty bitty, like a, a ladder for dwarves with wheels and a little motorcycle engine attached to it, and you know a little t- just enough body work to keep the bugs off you. The seats are even designed to be removed and used as lawn chairs. <laughs> I, I you not, yep. uh, and uh, and they're being chased by guys in uh, I believe they're Peugeot five hundred fours. You know, yeah. shooting at them and they're doing all these fabulous you know skidding maneuvers and things there's one part where going forward uh they, they can't turn around in time and the girl says go backwards forwards fast and she jams it into reverse and then they're doing that part of the chase in reverse yeah. uh you know the, the car rolls down a hill it bounces through uh, almond trees uh and they get away they they win the day but the bond franchise will never top the mystique and the the overall uh, I, I'm going to use the word splash pun unintended of the esprit the the, the that oh, yeah. thing just captured everyone's imagination at the time and I don't think they'll ever have a return of the magnitude of what that car meant to oh its totally fans. totally agree yeah uh, you know a, a lot of people you know when you say James Bond car they think of the the Aston Martin but. Honestly, the Esprit comes up as the the most memorable movie car of all time on a few surveys, yep. and just the it took the gadget thing to the extreme, and that just captured people's imaginations so hard. Yep. And uh, you know, if, if you read the blog on our on our site, I, I talk about it a little bit about how it got into the movie and things like that. And that's a good story in its own. Is uh, that the one that went in the water too? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, I had an Esprit for a while, and my fascination was all started with that movie. That's what got me into Lotus. 
And, uh, you know, when I owned it, it was, you know, it was funny because when I drove it around, well, the, the question I most got asked was, is that a Lamborghini? Uh, or no, not a Lamborghini, a DeLorean. They, everybody wanted to know if it was a DeLorean for some cockamamie reason. But uh, the second most often asked question was, will that go underwater? And, you know, the rather than answering that, uh, the appropriate question to come back with is, well, do you really want to be in a submarine with, an, with a British electrical set? <laughs> Good. The thing about cars, Diplomatic Corps would like to apologize to Her Majesty's <laughs> government now. <laughs> Excellent stuff, Ben. My oh, yeah. movie, the one I'm going to bring up today, is Repo Man. I don't know if oh. you guys remember this. 1984 era science fiction comedy, sort of a black comedy about a, a 19, well, a mysterious package in the back of a 1964 Chevrolet Malibu. And anybody who opened the trunk to look at the package would be vaporized. And there's a classic line that comes out of the movie that has nothing to do with the plot, has nothing to do with the car, but it's uh, there's these people who are walking away from some horror they just witnessed, and they're like, let's go commit some crimes. And the other line is, yeah, let's go eat sushi and not pay. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I love that film, but it's the 1964 Chevrolet Malibu that that stands out in my mind as being sort of the car for that movie, that, which was picked specifically because of its boxy nature. And in the end, it ends up glowing bright green before it flies through the city at extreme speeds and, and then eventually into space. So that's that's my car movie for for this episode, Repo Man. It's just it's a fun watch. It's it's a good bit of yeah. of, of sci-fi uh, nuttiness from my youth. I don't know. Maybe that's an oddball science fiction movie we should consider someday. The show uh, I would like to do. We combine the thing about cars with Mystery Science Theater three thousand. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> I think we should do that. That's a good idea. <laughs> you can have little puppets in the background. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We can have to make them out of leftover car parts, though, right? So, oh, yeah. that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Right, hey Don, you want to drive the decades today? Yes, I do. And actually, I, I'm glad that that was Ben's movie because I'm going to start with we're going to go back to the '90s. I decided yesterday to listen to '90s music, and I thought, you know, I haven't really talked about except for my probe, um, <laughs> my the '90s cars very much. <laughs> And and we'll start with the Lotus Esprit. Um, I found a site that talked about surprisingly affordable 1990s dream cars. And the Esprit is listed as one of those, which is very funny because the write-up says, uh, buying an older Lotus Esprit probably isn't a good idea, but there's really nothing else like it. Unlike competitors, uh, an Acura NSX and a Porsche 964, the Esprit prices have stayed in the thirty to forty thousand dollar range, but budget a lot for maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> Owning an Esprit might oh, yes. be a headache, but there's nothing quite like it. So I thought that was interesting. Do you concur, Ben? <clears throat> Pretty much, yeah. The one I had was an '86, but uh, you know, I know I know about all of them. Um, you know, the '86 was the original design from the early '70s by Zhu Jaro. Uh, in for the 1988 model year, they redesigned it. A fellow named Peter Stevens did that design. It was still pretty much the same stuff under the skin, just a little bit of a restyle. Uh, however, you know, GM bought Lotus in 1986, and access to the, the the greatest parts bin in the world was one of the best things that ever happened for Lotus. They were able to get things like electric power steering and some more modern fuel injection system, things like that. Uh, the four cylinder models of the nineties give you tremendous bang for the buck. You know, they've, uh, they've got, uh, you know, charge cooled engine you know, rated for something like 285 horsepower out of a 2.2 liter four cylinder turbo. Um, uh, the downside is this is all very dated hardware. It's, you know, it's ni early nineties GM stuff. Uh, so you'd be surprised how many parts for that are not, a, are, are all tough to get. It also uses a really primitive uh, OBD system that needs a piece of software on a laptop called FreeScan. You can download it for nothing, but you need a laptop with a serial port to use it to connect to the car. Um, you know, that was I current stuff at the time. If somebody wants to buy one from me, <laughs> I've got lots of serial right. ports. I still have my one own of the computers. upsides. Oh, yeah. One of the upsides, though, was that in this era, they redesigned the interior to be a little roomier, which is good, especially for tall people. Uh, you know, the Esprit came out during the reign of Colin Chapman, the founder, who was only five foot eight. And a lot of the cars from his era are a little 
tight, but after his passing, Mike Kimberly took over and, you know, he's about my height, you know, six feet plus. And so he, he made headroom and legroom a little more of a priority. The Esprit was a little bit reconfigured to allow a little more space. There's only so much you can work with, but yeah. Uh, but a lot of parts are from, you know, GM and Toyota too. Uh, you know, GM and Toyota were in cahoots in those days as well. So yeah, it's all around pretty good. If, if you've got the gumption to uh, to keep up with it, to to you know meet the demands of keeping it running, then and yeah, it is pretty good value. You know, a lot of the cars on this list, so it's it's a road and track uh, article from last April. Actually, they actually every single car that's on here, they list the price of you know what it's, it was it's selling for, at the, which was again just a year ago. And you know, a lot of Beamers on this list. I think that Beamer was a really big in the 90s that was kind of like coming out of the 80s into the 90s everybody was but there is a mercedes on here an sl 600 which was a v12 it is still um it's being sold for under thirty thousand, which is interesting because i i think you're right ben getting parts for these cars especially if you wreck them is going to be really tough um I've Boy, seen a lot just, of V12 Mercedes and supercharged Mercedes for real rock bottom prices. And part of the reason is because, yeah, once they get a certain amount of age on them, they are expensive to maintain. Very expensive. I thought the other fun thing on here that was really cute is a Dodge Viper. I forgot how cute those are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, it's a T-top <laughs> kind of car. It's like, you know, just got that little yeah. thing. And it uh, it's surprisingly... You can buy it for forty thousand. I thought, whoa, oh, yeah. um, that seemed a little bit high. But there have been, you know, if it's kind of roached out, you might be able to get it for ten thousand or something like that. Um, the Boxster was uh, of, on this list was for a steal, and I've seen Boxsters out there. It's you can find a good nine eleven for probably under ten thousand dollars, and I I think the. Those cars are the cutest cars in the world, those little boxsters. <laughs> um, so that, that was, you know, thinking of the 90s, like I said, there were a lot of Porsches on this list. Um, what car do you think should be on this list for the 90s? That's a tough call, but when I think of cars in the 90s, the thing that comes to my mind is uh, the Jelly Bean era. Uh, there, there was a big design trend among you know, the more pedestrian, you know, everyday kind of cars in the 90s that a lot of people referred to as jelly bean styling. The Celica, the Taurus and Sable, oh, those are really big examples of that. If you look at like a 96 Taurus, that rounded thing they were doing with it, that's jelly bean design. And it's, mm. it, I don't think it aged very well. Uh, and I still see them out on the road now. And yeah. Um, the other car, the last car on this list was something I don't think was sold in the in the states. It was a Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution. It's ah. uh, the same version as the EVO or Evo, and surprisingly has a pretty good value now for around twenty six thousand. It's coming over. It's an interesting looking car. It's a four door. It's got a nice grill on it. Uh, it doesn't fit that jelly bean model. It's a little bit more in the style yeah. of a Beamer. I know we had Lancers in this country. I yeah. don't know if we had Evos. Yeah, it's, Mitsubishi. To say, yeah, their styling was always a little edgier than you know, what was going on at the time. And the uh, yeah, the uh, that one, I believe, is really kind of a competitor, if not predecessor, to the Subaru WRX. Now, and the final car that I'll mention is a, is a Corvette. I don't know. The 90s, oh, yeah. For me, for me, the 90s Corvette just didn't do it. it there was something about it that even an 80s Corvette I thought was better than the 90s. And you can get one on eBay right now for $13,000. <laughs> so go out and refine yeah, your house and get a Corvette. <laughs> that's the beauty of Corvettes because there's so many different eras to choose from with each with their own flavor. And because they made a zillion of them, you know, the, the used ones are not expensive. I think in an earlier episode, you know, several, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I think I did a piece on why, you know, used Corvettes are really the best bang for the buck in sports cars. Mm -hmm. But if you, if and I know a guy, to... oh, you know, a guy, I know a guy who, I don't know if he still has it. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but he had a 98 and sometime around 2013 or 14 or 15 thereabout, he called me up and saying it was having a couple of problems with, you know, some electrical faults and rattling noises 
this car had a quarter million miles on it. Wow. And, you know, and he still drove it almost daily. It was, other than those little issues, it was pretty reliable. I mean, it got from A to B. It didn't break down anywhere. And I found out that all the things wrong were things that were cheap and easy to fix. And he said, I'm going to keep on driving it until some new business venture, you know, puts enough cash in my pocket to buy a new one. I don't know if you ever got the new one. (laughs) So those, you know, again, you can find this list on um, Road and Track. It was published last year, 23 surprisingly affordable 90s dream cars. Yep. And there's a lot. I mean, the the long list, I I think the, the last one that I will leave us with is on this list is a GMC Cyclone. Which was a truck. Yep. And oh, yeah. yeah, it's I and it's a to me, um they you know, they say they can be hard to find, but they uh are under forty thousand and it, it surprisingly is a pickup truck. It says it could outrun a Ferrari to sixty miles per hour. I've heard that they're bringing it back. I've heard that there's gonna be a twenty twenty one G Oh, interesting. But, uh, it's a rumor. I have not confirmed it. So Okay. Uh, well, those are the those are the cars. Uh, if you want to start looking on eBay, uh, get out there and and see because summer's here and it's time to put the top down and get out on the road. Very cool. Thank you, Don. You guys got anything else before we wrap the episode? Dave, anything on your mind? Oh, so many things. So <laughs> many things. <laughs> Going back to the nineties, I'm you know I'm reliving cars. I'm also reliving several unfortunate decisions on my part. Uh, All <laughs> right. Nothing that I really feel like is, is germane to the episode. I was going to say, is this the thing about relationships or the thing about investment opportunities or? <laughs> yeah, really and truthfully, we don't we we don't want to. We're not looking back. We're looking back. <laughs> excellent, excellent stuff. I spent most of the nineties driving a nineteen eighty three Accord that I still miss. Uh, yeah. I missed my 1988 Prelude. That was a killer car. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was nothing to even look at. There was nothing special about it from a visual perspective, but that car just rocked. It spoke to me. Ben, uh, let's do our grand trivia auto and wrap the episode. Right on. So the question was, as y'all recall, what was the first foreign automaker to assemble cars in the USA? Was it Toyota, Volkswagen, Rolls Royce, or Honda? Ooh. I'll go first. Okay, go, Don. I'm going to say it was Falve. <laughs> right. <laughs> VW. Yep, that's how they pronounce it over there. Yep, Falve. Huh. I got a shout out to my Misty Day. Yeah. yeah, we are. Why do you think it's VW, Don? I, because I, I have a feeling with all the wars and certain production that VW did, it would make sense to be produced here. And so I'm just, I'm just thinking... And, you know, we saw Volkswagens, you know, when you think of the classic Beetle and the and the little VW van, they were just so everywhere. So I, I don't know. Just think of Volkswagen. Yeah, yeah. Dave, what about you? I'm thinking it's Rolls-Royce. And <laughs> okay. I'm actually, I'm basing this on the fact that Rolls-Royce was actually building aircraft engines in the United States before World War One. So... Banking on that. All right. So Don's thinking VW. Dave's thinking Dave's thinking Rolls Royce. I'm going to say Toyota for no good reason at all, just to be a little <laughs> bit of a statistical difference. And I mean, maybe there's a little bit of logic, you know, than wanting to be able to get their cars to the American market cheaper or building trust with the American population or something like that by hiring our folks to to build them. That I don't know. Something in there makes a little bit of sense to me. Ben, what's the answer? Well, the answer is Rolls Royce. <laughs> Congratulations, Dave. Unfortunately, we do not have a Rolls Royce as the prize. But, uh, <laughs> but no, they. Uh, what happened was in 1921. This is the Roaring Twenties. Remember, uh, yeah, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Yeah, in 1921, Rolls Royce opened a new factory in Springfield, Massachusetts, because there was a, a three-year backlog of demand in the United States for their cars. Wow. This factory called Rolls-Royce of America Incorporated produced Silver Ghost and Phantom models and operated for 10 years. The first car beat was completed on January 17th, 1921. When the factory closed in 1931, 2,944 cars had been produced. The first 25 cars were assembled of all foreign parts, but subsequent parts had U.S.-built coachwork. Springfield had previously been the location of the Duryea Motor Wagon Company, which made the first American gasoline-powered vehicle. Uh, Of course, as a footnote here, Volkswagen was the first foreign maker of mass-produced cars to assemble in the United States. 
uh, big difference there, you know, the quantities involved. Um, you know, they opened their plant in Westmoreland, Pennsylvania in 1978. And to this day, the U.S. built Rolls Royces are often referred to as Springfield Rolls Royces. Uh, I saw one a few months ago in a museum. They're usually pretty easy to spot. Uh, one of the things, it, well, first of all, it'll be a 1920s model, but they have left-hand drive. Uh, many of them have horizontal slats in their radiator grill instead of vertical ones. And many of them use a different style of headlight than the British built ones, a more cylindrical housing than teardrop shaped. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. <laughs> okay, so Dave wins this one. Yeah. Well, there's no Rolls Royce involved, so I, it's a sad. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty sorry. hollow victory for me, Mickey. I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> we'll do better next time. <laughs> but uh, excellent episode, you guys. Thank you, and to our listener, thank you for being part of the Thing About Cars family. Uh, please leave us a note of feedback either on the Facebook page for the Thing About Cars or a rating would be great if you could leave us a rating uh, on Apple Podcast or wherever it is that you find the Thing About Cars. We'd appreciate it. In the meantime, we hope you and yours are doing well and enjoying the weather, and we'll see you with another episode in about a week. Take care, you guys. Bye, all. See ya. Thank you for listening. This has been The Thing About Cars. We'll see you on the road.